Good evening and welcome to the fourth in the series of Poetry at the Lexicon Readings. My name is Rosamond Taylor. Welcome to B.B. Ashley, Sean Hewitt and Richard Scott and thank you for coming. Thank you also to Marion Keyes at the Lexicon for her help and encouragement in facilitating this reading. I'm thrilled so many people have been enjoying this series and I'm very excited to share the following reading with you. Today our reading is in celebration of the One Dublin One Book project in which we are drawing inspiration from Leonard and Hungry Paul by Ronan Hessian for its themes of love, kindness and connection. It's a real privilege to have BB, Sean and Richard here today. They are writers whose work always captures my attention. Each explore love, sexuality and interconnection in rich and unique ways and all three are accomplished poets who ask what poetry is for and what it can do. They are also poets who are always in dialogue with other artists, whether it's Paul Verlaine, Harry Styles, or the medieval Irish writer of the Willa Swivna. They each approach their poetry in very different ways, and I think their work will complement and challenge one another's. Before each poet reads, I will introduce them to you briefly, then they will read for around 15 minutes. Afterwards, we'll discuss their work together. So first up, we have Bibi Ashley. Bibi lives in Belfast. Her debut poetry collection, Gold Light Shining, was published by Banshee Press in October 2020. She is an AHRC-funded PhD candidate at the Seamus Heaney Centre for Poetry, where she's working on a collection of poetry that charts her progress towards qualifying as a British Sign Language interpreter. When procrastinating from her PhD, BB takes British Sign Language and Braille classes and writes pop culture articles for United by Pop, specialising in Harry Styles. Witty, imaginative and deeply felt, BB Ashley's work takes inspiration from pop culture, particularly from Harry Styles. Her work draws on the passion we feel for those we respect and admire, while she develops insights into love, modern life and how we engage with media. We witness someone trying to make sense of their life in a world where technology and media both bring us closer together and further apart, such as in Ink and Hellebore, a poem about digital detox day and how the lack of phones doesn't always make us more interpersonally connected. Bibi's poetry is full of lush detail and a sense of the surreal while looking tenderly at the vulnerable person inside all of us. Her poems seek moments of clarity, such as in Ever Since New York, where she describes the way the flame burns for the quickest moment under my thumb. So welcome, Bibi. I'm delighted you could join us. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Rosalind, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to the Don Ligari Library for bringing us all together today. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to read from Gold Light Shining. It's still such a thrill just to like hold it and be able to open it and read from it. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here. Um, the book is in four sections. Um, there's fandom, fangirl, fanfic, and fan mail. And I'll be reading across um, all the sections today, just to give you a bit of a taste of each. Um, yeah, as mentioned, this book started with um, Harry Styles when I had Fresh's Flu. And believe it or not, I didn't know who Harry Styles was or One Direction at that time. So it's been quite a journey um, over the past few years or so. Um, but because of that, I think it's really important that I start with the epigraph as I think that really like sets the tone for the, for the collection and for the reading. Everyone in that room is on the same page and everyone knows what I stand for. I'm not saying I understand how it feels. I'm just trying to say, I see you. Harry Styles. Harry, I'm not saying I understand how it feels. I'm just trying to say, I see you. Kiwi, Kiwi, Kiwi. The boy with the Gucci guitar strings is playing glam rock to a room of strangers. His photographer captures a group of girls in knockoff floral suits and pink sequin Chelsea boots. Heart thumping, heavy jump shakes the strings on the concrete floor. The guitarist who used to work in the pizza shop looks to the bassist, the keys, the drummer to know if this is normal. It is not normal. People are having the time of their lives. 
never going back now. Nobody knew I would spend the next year writing about flares with flora and fauna print. I think most about the yellow silk trousers, their shelves of potted plants climbing the inseam. Nearly always a continent away, I wait in the wrong time zone for lights up, for pixels of dry ice and smoke to clear in the poor connection of the periscope. It wasn't until the embellishments of Basel that I started preparing for next year's silhouette. With a travel scholarship, with beauty papers, I elaborate on a Peter Pan collar and pearls. I always find it so funny that as soon as I start reading, I feel like my whole mouth is full of like cotton wool. Um, okay, uh, Carolina. In the photograph on the fridge, we had just met. She was wonderful, but I was dizzy with jet lag. So there was a blur to the moment of capture. It was New Year's Eve and we waited for the fright of fireworks to wake us. She laughed behind her spoon as I stirred half a teaspoon of honey through her coffee, a miniature of slow gin into my own. It was only when she was distracted by three glass ramekins of coconut cake that I found the right aperture. I haven't seen her since, but I remember her name and what her grandmother texted at the turn of the year. Um, so I was really interested in, in kind of like collage techniques when I was forming this book. And um, this next one is um, collaged from Act 3, Scene 3 of Othello, because the phrase Sweet Creature, which is also a title of um, one of Harry's songs on, on his debut album, um, first appears in, in Othello. So I thought it'd be fun to, to use all those phrases. Sweet Creature. It is impossible to watch you kiss a strawberry from a polite distance. Nobody seems to dance well in Venice but you, and you are not even well. The marble here swallows the wolves and their whores, obedient and abused. Our black knight is humbled by the chaos that is salt and ice intermingled. Take heaven, I'll steal the soft parts of hell for you, drowsy on syrups of the world. Go, leave me in the garden of the castle. I am almost happily on my knees. Um, so this next poem, I was really, really lucky to be able to go to Jordan on a cultural exchange visit um, in 2019, I think, um, with the University of Petra. And it was my first experience of the Middle East and really like a beautiful trip. And one of my favorite moments from that trip was when we were on a campus tour and I was wearing, as I often do, like a Harry Styles t-shirt or a Harry Styles. And um, one of our, our student cultural partners, they noticed my t-shirt and then they, they told me that they liked Harry too. And it was just such a beautiful moment because then we just got to like fangirl together in this place where I'd never been before and I'd never really expected to make um, such a connection with another person. And it was just so joyful. Um, so this poem is one of my favorites. And I always think about Jordan and I think about the night market. We went there um, when I read this poem. Cinnamon, honey, butter. Popcorn spits and oil sputters from the open pan onto the stairwell and into the hands of a boy who, eyebrows high and jaw slack, laughs and throws it, catching it tightly between his teeth. Not seasoned with the cinnamon honey butter, but salted, it melts by the warmth of his tongue. Ahead, the beekeepers are making a commotion. Glass shards have fallen between the cobblestones. A grandmother curses her husband's unreliable hands. Locals begin tallying pathways in the sky. The boy turns and translates for the tourists. The stars are out and so are the bees. Run. Um, this poem was a commission for the National Trust a few years ago as well. Um, and it was one of the first times where I really thought I could kind of be taken seriously, like writing about like fandom and fangirling and music and, and poetry. Um, so this was like a very affirmative moment in, in writing this collection. Give pop music, give peace a chance. A grandmother stands in the Terrace Hill garden as the foliage shifts and trembles in the wind. Her grandchildren explore as fungi rise and retreat along the beech tree bark on the woodland floor. Her dog bolts itself over a stroll of bluebells, and the grandmother is happy in the sunken garden, watching each contour, sketching the valley, searching her sprawling city for home. The young ranger runs to collect the grass cuttings and the fallen plums, points and shouts at the small copper butterfly landing on the short blade scythe. Look, a gorgeous thing! 
The grandmother, knowing this place is a gorgeous thing, remembers perpetual rain clouds, pop music, potential, marmalade, deep joy, a telegram from John and Yoko, the thrill of running coloured chalk through the ends of her hair. She remembers sticking her thumb pad against the pin back of a badge that served as her first concert ticket. She traces the loop and swirl of her fingertip, finds ink smudges from felt tip pens and placards for peace. There are signs of the seasons turning. Nothing small or insignificant is rooted here. And finally, um, I want to read kind of from the end sequence um, that is titled Fan Mail. And there's this really incredible... Um, girl in America her name is Alison Gross and she writes these newsletters um that are like intense think pieces that started out as One Direction and kind of follows them or has followed them as they've gone on to their solo work but it was such a great introduction to me kind of looking at fandom in like an academic lens um but then you know this newsletter is still filled with like these insane tweets and um really fun things like that so um they became a real source of like inspiration for the collection and this final sequence all um kind of plays around and references those but um so thank you Ali for writing those um, and I hope you enjoyed being in this book <laughs> look this is how it really feels excuse me sorry hi we took a photograph no distance between the two of us a tangled moment I could not stop from rupturing out of body magnified through the window of a small cafe in North London I remember fragments, the shallow questions that people ask a collective popular object. Within five minutes, I knew I loved the stranger in my head. Like the washing machine on spin cycle. I am blonde and drunk dancing in the dark to nice boys with acoustic guitars. I intended to be on my own, but it's fun to put on a good show of awkward hip thrusts and hurt feet. There is something that reminds me of the best photo from a cheap camera. The hue of sweetness and ease extends to the endearing flat at the edge of town, to the beautiful, sexy pirate prince who spins, soft-edged and boyish, in a white t-shirt. And that poem has a reference to one of my favourite Harry Styles looks as well, um, from Harris Reed's um, Amsterdam tour look, so please go look that up. Ghost. He dances to layered vocals, navigates the cool guy criticism in private conversations and parlour games. He translates adjectives into chord progressions, and to feel good, he describes the sunflowers in the kitchens, sign of swagger and joy. He is afraid of the uproar, but is lucky enough to be beautiful. In a time when joy feels like an endangered resource, things are very simple, protect each other. Profile. In the end, it is impossible to forget the beauty of abandoned pop stars. There is a sense they withstood the first few punches in the media landscape and stitched together the things they loved with trademark enthusiasm. Do not fear their dulcimers and sparkly oven stickers, their mushroom lunches, their behind the scene meditations. Let them discover drunken karaoke. Let them defend the quiet hour of time they can ride around Malibu in a Tesla. Um, so thank you for listening today. My final poem um, is titled Harry. You found something peculiar being anonymous in Japan, even with the katakana of your name embroidered onto soft hoodie fabric. You let the Shiba Inu lick the residential plants hiding from the residential air conditioning unit. You jogged the yellow tiled steps in yellow striped socks. You pushed aside the painful stage of growing out curls with gravity in a place that seemed to stretch sideways in all seasons. Of all the moonstruck moments, this is the one I'd most like to meet. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bibi. That was fantastic. It was such a treat to hear you read. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next up we have Sean Hewitt. Uh, Sean is a poet, lecturer and literary critic. His debut collection, Tongues of Fire, Cape 2020, was shortlisted for Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award. In 2019, he won an Eric Gregory Award and he is also the winner of the Resurgence Prize, 2017. His memoir, All Down, Darkness Wide, will be published in 2022 by Jonathan Cape in the UK. Sean has a gift for evoking the beauty and subtlety of nature, such as the bark of an oak tree or the colours and shapes of a fungus. In his work, nature is a source of solace, but also a place 
as in his translations of the medieval Irish poem, Willa Swivna, that can reflect madness. Nature is brittle, fragile, and Sean uses images of the natural world to explore personal grief or moments of deep emotion. His poems can travel very far, such as in Adoration, where we journey between countries, Ireland, Germany, seasons, the urban and the rural, and explore the tensions of queer love and lust. Yet Sean always remains in control of his subjects and ultimately brings us to a place of contemplation and insight. Sean is a deft and lyrical poet, never failing to draw in his reader with work that surprises and cuts to the core of his subjects. Thank you for joining us today, Sean. I'm really looking forward to it. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Hekwan, um, which is just the name of a uh, lake uh, near where I used to live in Sweden, outside Gothenburg. Um, Hekwan. Running barefoot, green moss lit between trees, I go one foot after the other, arriving on instinct between roots, dodging with white feet the white slugs swelled on forest light, and you disappear ahead of slanting pines. My pale step padding on this sloping peat path that sinks like a trapdoor underfoot, and then I leap. I love to plunge through the black glass of the lake to make it echo with my body, feeling the water's cold resistance. For a long moment, I plumb its dark core, and then its arms rush in and lift me back to the light. In Dublin, uh, in the National Museum, I was walking around looking at the, the bog bodies, and if anyone has ever um, had the privilege of doing that, it's a very strange and unsettling uh, experience. There are pillars that you can walk inside, uh, and a, a small slope that you can go in and just spend this really intimate time with a bog body one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, and one of the bog bodies that I was particularly struck by was uh, Old Crocken Man. Um, and the information in the museum tells you that he was six foot seven. Um, he is uh, a rich man. Uh, they found uh, the food in his stomach so they know he was uh, well fed, well respected. Um, at the moment, he is only a torso, um, he doesn't have a head. Um, but there is a strange thing about his body in that the nipples are cut underneath. And I spent some time reading about this. One of the theories about why the nipples were cut is that um, in, in that society, uh, suckling uh, nipples was a sign of submission. So um, the theory is that he couldn't be king if they cut his nipples off because no one could submit to him. Um, so that is one of the theories as to why his nipples are cut. Uh, so this poem begins uh, with an epigraph. It's called Old Crocken Man. Their nipples were cut, thus rendering them ineligible for kingship. The suckling of a king's nipples was an important gesture of submission. Only a torso now, the head long severed from the neck, pelvis twisted off like a stubborn root. Remember the worn jacket pressed in the bog, above the galaxies of cotton grass turned inside out like little souls among the eyebrows, the stitch works. No place to leave a man alone. And under each nipple, a deep incision, blade width. Even then, they needed boys like me to leave power in our wake, to dip our heads 
and take to the soft pink mount. I would have felt then the making of a kink, known God through my lips entering the body. I thought I would read some newer poems um, as well today. Uh, I say newer, but these are at least a year old. Um, that's as new as I get uh, after lockdown. Um, uh, this first poem, you, you might be able to see on the wall behind me, there's this illustration of a head. Um, it's a woodcut of a head by the artist Joe Sweeting, uh, which she made uh, to accompany this poem. Um, it's called Evening with Ghost Moths. Um, and a ghost moth, um, for those of you like me before I discovered them, uh, who don't know what they are, um, they're these small moths, and uh, uh, the top of their wings is white, and the underside is, is very dark. So when they fly at, uh, at dusk, it looks like they're disappearing um, because you can only see them when they open, then they kind of twist, and then they're gone all of a sudden, and then they reappear. Uh, so they have this weird optical illusion, which is why they're called uh, ghost moths. Um, so, evening with ghost moths. The field damp. My father, six weeks gone to the day. And then these frail, glimmering flecks turning in the seed heads of the long grass. The shape of sycamore keys tumbling, turned spirit, flights of white flicking quickly, and the underwing dark, so a flash of light and then nothing, gone. Then again a shimmering, a dance, the veil of the world shook, glinting split second, each moth, a door spinning open, then shut. What apertures are these? Into which hole in the night are they vanishing? Little spectres, each body a fitful apparition, undoing its sign on the dark, so that for longer than I know, I am held like a child, my darting eyes waiting for you, Father, to turn your white side open, to show yourself. Just before lockdown uh, last year, I was lucky enough to um, be given a cottage in the Lake District, um, which I think came along with the Eric Gregory uh, Award. Um, so I spent February in this uh, hamlet called Hartsop, um, which is nestled in between uh, some quite big mountains, and the weather was uh, very rough. Um, but one of the things that, about the cottage was that next door there was um, a sheep farm, um, or well, the sheep would go up onto the fells, uh, and they had a lot of sheep dogs. Uh, but they were trialling a new thing uh, with these dogs called hunterways, which I think are from New Zealand. And um, rather than running uh, like the sheepdogs uh, we know here, they bark uh, to round the sheep up. Uh, but the thing is, they never stop barking. So all the way through the night, they bark constantly. Um, <laughs> begins with a reference to Hunterway, um, and that's what they are. Uh, it also begins with an epigraph, which now seems um, a bit on the nose, uh, but this was written pre uh, pre um, it's from the Psalms. Um, sleepwalk. Loved one and friend hast thou put far from me, a mine acquaintance into darkness. Psalms 88, 18. Not the bark of the hunterways, nor how they built a tower of sound, nor the stream nor its rearrangements, not the shadow of the fell or the oil of the night, 
across it. Not the hollow, nor the owls, though these know it. Not the clank of the gate, nor the stones, nor the hand of the water taking mine. As when the shapes of the hills hold, give way, are gone. As when the fog lowers its loss along the banks, along the ridges. As when the stone walls pour white like mouths discharging. As when a candle shone upon my head where I walked. Nor how I touch the rose hips, first with my torch, now my hand, here, then here, puckered with the body of their flower, nor the hazel, contracted at night to its brocade, which I lift, nor its catkins hanging silver, nor the fog, only its movement, its ghost, as through a rude screen, its breathing, nor the wicks, nor the fires in the branches, lovely, monastic, nor how I step through the mist about me, having no body, nor hands held aloft, a curtain, shattered water, deeper, seeking, knowing that you are waiting at the heart. I just finish off with uh, a short poem, um, which I think is probably um, a poem that will um, will read again as a lockdown poem. <laughs> um, I think I just tend to write about being alone a lot, so uh, these just tend to read like um, isolation poems. Um, but in Emma. Uh, in Dublin, the Museum of uh, Modern Art, uh, which is just down the road from me. Uh, there's some small ornamental gardens, and uh, in the corner of the garden, there is a, a grave um, of a horse um, with a rider's inscription. It used to be a military building, so uh, there's a, a horse's grave there. Uh, and that features in this poem. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and this poem is just called Still. In the ornamental gardens, the fountains flowed to no one. A month of solitude, and the quiet shone out like a struck bell. By the stone wall, a horse's grave, and the rider's dream that the creatures we have cherished here below might give us joyous greeting when we have passed the gate. And I cried because I held it too, that hope of reunion sustained against my better judgment. And still I knew I would go with him to stand by that field in some dreamt of heaven and wait to hear the thundering rush and see the grass torn up into a crowd of hooves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sean. That was wonderful. It was fantastic to hear you read. And it was lovely to hear some new work as well. Very exciting. So thank you. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Richard Scott. Richard Scott was born in London in 1981. His publications include Soho, Faber and Faber 2018. Recent works include Woman Peeling Turnips, A Portrait of My Father, an 18 part poem written in response to his residency at Southwark Park Galleries and broadcast on Resonance FM. And Glasgow Green Redux, commissioned by the National Poetry Library and the Edwin Morgan Trust to celebrate Edwin Morgan's centenary. Richard's poetry has been translated into German and French. He teches poetry at the Faber Academy. 
The opening poem of Richard's collection, Soho, Public Library, 1998, describes a young man trying to find queer literature. This is a central concern for the whole collection, the erasure of queer voices and the poet's ongoing conversation with queer literature. Public Library, 1998, is also typical of the rest of the collection in its embrace of eroticism and the realities of the body. Richard's poetry is a tapestry of references to other poets, Whitman, Rilke, Verlaine, Mark Doty, which creates a richness and depth in his work. But Richard's poetry is also full of energy, easy to grasp, as well as funny and tender. As such, it's an antidote to inaccessible academic poetry that's afraid to touch on the realities of the body. He pulls off the balancing act of writing about poetry and yet creating something that feels new and utterly unique. I'm really looking forward to hearing you read. Thanks, Richard. Um, thank you so much for that incredibly generous and thoughtful introduction, uh, Rosamond. Um, it's such a joy to be here. Um, I, I wish we were all together at the Don Leary Lexicon Library. Um, that would be so nice, but um, I'm in Campbell um, and I'm on the internet. Uh, but it, I mean, it's still a complete joy to be here. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, and you really generously mentioned my poem, Public Library, 1998. So I'll start with that. In the library, where there is not one gay poem, not even Kavafi eyeing his grappa sozzled lads, I open again the golden treasury of verse and write cock in the margin. Ink stains my fingers, words stretch to diagrams, birth beards and thighs, shoulders, forgies. One biro boy rubs his hard on against the body of a sonnet. Another bears his hole beside some larkin. A blue sailor spooges over Canto 12. Then I see it. Nestled like a mushroom in moss, tongue, true, and a queer subtext. And my pen becomes an indigo highlighter, inking up what the editor could not. The bullet outman hidden deep. I underlined those that nature, not the printer, had pricked out, rimming each delicate stanza in cerulean, illuminating the readers to come. And I, I really wrote that poem in response to growing up under the shadow of Section 28, this really heinous. Um, horrific piece of government legislation that forbade the, um, well, as they saw it, the promotion of um, uh, queer sex education and queer literature. So the public libraries and school libraries when I was growing up, they were devoid of any gay poetry. Um, but it's so joyful to read that um, now, thinking about um, a beautiful library today, like the library in Don Leary. Um, libraries now have um, queer sections, LGBTQ sections, and that makes me so happy. It's such a joyful uh, thing to speak about and think about. So, yeah. Um, I, I was thinking a bit more about the library, um, actually, in, in preparation for this reading. Um, I was kind of a pretty um, lonely and queer teenager, and I spent a lot of time um, hiding away in the library, um, and it was an extraordinary kind of amazing place, despite being devoid of kind of great influences, it was still a beautiful place of literature, um, and I loved being there. Um, but I guess I also had that kind of um, strange thing where like, um, if someone would come in, like a bully or someone, and they would kind of see you there, and that, that sense of being seen or being caught out would evoke a deep sort of sense of shame in me. And I used to blush an awful lot when things like that. Um, happened. So I'll, I'll read this poem now that kind of is about being seen um, and feeling that sense of shame and, and um, that evoking a kind of blush response within you. And, and I should say that Eve in the poem is not the biblical Eve, but Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick. 
How could I forget the hot-faced trauma, the instant rash jam that spread a sunburn across my face, neck, ears, ages 9 to 22, when a boy looked at me or looked away, my blush, we called it, except for Dad, who said, what family are you a member of? But shame is my birthmark, semaphore of blood vessels, skin stain. A shame-prone person is a person who has been shamed, says Eve, still. I don't remember the stone, just the ripple flash of heat pricks moving from shame to shyness to shining. I hated, still hate this body. Um, and I thought I might read a slightly happier um, poem from that kind of talks back to my school days in a way. Um, it's kind of about having a crush. Um, I thought I would um, I, I would read this in response to Vivi's really moving poems about um, Harry Styles and fandom. So this was a kind of early fandom for me. My stag. Ian Tavner for a 50p bet peeled and jointed a stag beetle with his red penknife, ripping off all eight agate legs, ferreting out the fold-up Tiffany lamp wing, beheading the stag with a butcher's confidence. When the dead beetle was laid out like a disassembled carburetor, winking blue-black in the schoolyard sun, pleat the bet, Ian chased each body part down with a swig of cherry cola. Our gang left grossed out, but I had the stomach for it. I was in love. I wiped his pink mouth with my air sleeve. Proudly gripped his surgeon's hand beneath the battered lunch bench, desperate for his kiss. Um, and um, Rosamond was so kind to mention my obsession with uh, Paul Verlaine. And um, yeah, I, I am totally <laughs> obsessed with Paul Verlaine. Um, and there's there's some poems in my book that kind of talk back to that obsession, um, and I suppose the poems are in a way like a loved kind of um, reading reading of poetry and what that brings to you. A, me becoming obsessed with him became a way of accessing a queer ancestor who would kind of um, I don't know he was kind of a, a kind of support I suppose, um, and. It, in a way, the poems try to sort of thank him for that support by kind of um, injecting a bit of um, radical queerness back into um, uh, translations or versions of, of his work. Um, Paul Verlaine was a really kind of radical queer figure, um, you know, before we even really talked about um, things like homosexuality. He was running around with Rambeau in... France and London and Belgium, um, and even though some of his work is is very queer, some of his better known poems um, they don't really they don't really speak to that, and um, and translations of them have kind of um, slightly shaved off edges. So I kind of wanted to inject a bit of queerness um, in a way that is respectful and, and that I hope he would approve of. Um, so. The soul becomes a grinder profile, and uh, a ballroom becomes a sauna. Those kind of things. Um, but I'll just read a few of these now. Paul Verlaine. Blue screen. Your grinder profile is an emoticon paradise where camels and kittens go dancing and flashing. But I can tell they are sad beneath their primary colours. Your preferences brag in aerial bold, single, passive, no strings fun, but they don't like themselves, so melt back into the blue screen, into the silent blue screen blank and sad that makes the emoticons dream within their programming 
and code run like teardrops. C, C++ song beneath your touch screen. Sertraline. It's raining in my heart. What does that even mean? And why am I so sad all the fucking time? Still, it pours on. The slate roofs are black. The gardens are swamp. Droplets on the pavement. Such white noise is almost calming. So how come my head's a cloud and my heart's a puddle? Middle-class boys like me haven't known tragedy, and yet this dark rain saturating my heart. Green. Here's a plastic basket of polyester tulips, plus a heart-shaped card that sings, I love you. Don't recycle them. Please be happy with my pound store present. I stink. I'm pretty sweaty. I've been walking this whole damp night to get here. Let me curl around your converse cat-like and dream of our cherry days. Maybe I could put my head still burning from the memory of your hubba bubba kisses onto your broad chest just till I feel a bit better. Perhaps grab some shut eye while you doze off. Love version of. Tonight, I watched you sleep naked on the futon, face down, Sweaty like a small child, and knew that everything else was bullshit. It's so hard to stay alive these days, or sane. So keep on snoring, Danny, while I guard you like a Rottweiler. Being in love with you is fucking awful, because one day you'll stop breathing. In this grey light you already look dead. But then you smile. Thank fuck. What are you dreaming about, baby? Wake up. Tell me if the word soul still means anything. Um, thank you so much for listening. It's been such an unbelievable joy um to read for you um and i'll just finish with um uh this last poem we started uh, with a poem about public libraries so i'll read now a poem about um public toilets um oh. and I, I i want to read for sean or to sean's work like um his expert handling of, of queerness and, and the natural world and this is in a way my most um i suppose my most um, natural poem or environmental poem speaks to those things. Thank you for listening. Public toilets in Regent's Park. The men here are bird-footed, feathering past the attendant's two-way mirror, unperturbed by the colonizing microorganisms, Willedia, Cobisha, Shigalosis sliming across the yellowed grouting, the fist deep pool of brackish water quivering in the U bend, the tile that reads for information on venereal disease telephone 01. All for the thrill of placing their knees on the piss stained coal, the iris shimmering behind a hand carved glory hole. A beautiful cock unfolding like a swan's neck from the Harris tweed of a city gent's suit. Whispers, gasps of contact echo inside each nested cubicle. But careful, the prying attendant will rattle her bucket and mop if she spies four shoes. Our men disperse as mallards from the face of a pond. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Richard. It was fantastic to hear you read. I really enjoyed that. And it was wonderful to hear from all three of you. Um, as I've said before at these, um, I'm sure you would be getting a massive round of applause if we were in the theatre. And one of the hardest things about not being in the theatre is that we can't applaud you and appreciate you properly. But I'm, but you were all fantastic. And it was just such a play. So I was going to ask a few questions and um, feel free to ask one another questions too. Um, so firstly, I was wanted to mention, we have our One Dublin, One Book novel, Leonard and Hungry Paul, which looks at what it means to be outside of society. But it's also, I think, a novel very much about human connection. And I think the stereotype about us as poets is that we're kind of outsiders, we're lonely, we're stuck in our garrets. Um, I wondered if you think that's true, or is poetry a place that you have found? Um, oh gosh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess, I mean, in some ways I can only talk for myself. Like, I feel like, um, as a queer person, I have spent a lot of time kind of um, you know, on, on my own. And um, I think that sense of kind of being on my own or slightly hiding kind of, um, you know, when I was younger, kind of like, you know, hiding from bullies or, you know, stuff like that. Like, I think that kind of actually in some ways really helped me kind of focus down and know what it was like to spend time on, on my own and, and um, kind of obsess about something and think about something. I think that really helped with my poetry um, or helped me gain the skills that I might, you know, use to write poetry. But I don't know, I mean, I, I have to say, like, you know, being a poet and reading with poets and meeting other poets is, is a really lovely experience. And, and you know, I, I'm part of several workshops and um, the support I get from that is, is really beautiful. So um, I don't know, it's, it's, you know, sometimes I feel like poetry is sometimes dissolving some, some of that kind of privacy or, or, or quietness um, in a very sort of slow and loving way but then I guess you, you do also need that kind of um, intense focus so you can focus down on language yourself you know like poetry is a kind of private focus and obsession so I'd be interested to hear what Sean and do we think yeah mm -hmm. okay okay um I think that's an interesting question. As it is difficult to answer now because I feel like we are still like very much reeling from this long-term lockdown situation. So it is difficult to kind of be a bit like objective with it. Um, I think like it's interesting because it sometimes feel like poetry is so full of like competition that it kind of overrides the sense of community. But at the same time, I do think probably one of the best feelings I've had has been when somebody has said to me like they've like read a poem or they've picked up my book or like any of that even if it's my friends it still feels so like unexpected and so generous every time that they're willing to kind of give their time and money and, and kind of like thought into something that is very like insular in the process um and can be very I think it can be very isolating and especially when you're kind of fighting with yourselves over what seems to be really mundane things about like a line break or a comma or like just things that you get so in your head about um, it's really difficult to kind of let that go but I think at the same time you do get these real highs of, of feeling like supported by everyone else and and having like the opportunity to read other people's work like there are several things I want to say that I feel like I can't say so it's great to be able to read um, like Richard and Sean's work and then read it in, in their way and then find my own way into that um, so it's a difficult question and I think I'll be thinking of that mm -hmm. for some time actually Yeah, I think I probably, uh, well, I agree with both of you um, in, in that I think, you know, we often kind of seek the connection through the poem. Uh, so it's like an isolated thought seeking community. Perhaps that is what a poem is. Um, and <laughs> so, you know, like we, you have that necessary isolation to write a poem, but the whole purpose of writing it is that you hope that there will be someone to read it sometimes uh, not all the time I think sometimes I, I write hoping that no one will read it um, but um, yeah there, there has to be some sort of uh, community and I think you know often poetry has this kind of closed economy feeling to it where we we all read each other's work and we all see each other um, relatively 
uh, often. And it's also finding people outside of that that uh, closed economy, which is which is a real I think, uh, and a hard thing uh, to do in, in an art form that um, often puts people on its, by its name. Um, but actually, I've, I would have I would have answered. Um, I think more clearly, yes, that I'm quite a. a I require a bit of isolation to to write a poem before, um, but having had a year of isolation, I think that's probably too much. Um, and uh, I realise that actually, I need the isolation retreating from something that's going on, um, mm. and that is a helpful thing. But uh, being left on my own, I think there's not enough. Well, I mean. Uh, uh, in, in one way, there's loads happening, and in another way, there's just far too little happening. Uh, I find it quite difficult to, to write poems um, because I'm like, what happened? You know, I, I, I don't even know what happens on the day-to-day, -day, really. Um, and and the big stuff is, is kind of too big for me to, to put into a poem at the moment. Uh, so uh, I'm struggling with the paradox of isolation and... Um, yeah, before this, I yeah, think, I think it's was really. But... Yeah, I think it's really tricky. I mean, I found that um, during the lockdown, it's probably been a time when I've realised how much connection poetry does bring me personally, and that I've been talking a lot more to other poets, and I've really depended on the connections I've had with other poets. Um, whereas beforehand, I might have said, "No, I'm very writing on my own is what's really important to me." And now I'm realizing that I was actually, I'd actually developed various connections that have meant a lot to me. So it's, it's interesting. Um, Phoebe, I was going to ask you a question about, um, and it kind of applies to Richard as well, but I'll ask you first. Uh, that you often, I'm really interested in the way you collage or analyze or use pieces from other sources directly in your work. And I wondered, is there something particular about a pop song or a zine that would spark your imagination? Um, I think it really does vary. Like often it, I, when I'm thinking about kind of collage, like I want to take something and then like I don't want to recognize where it's from or um, you know, Harry Styles very well, then you might pick up like several references um, to like the textures of tour suits and things like that. Like it, it's fun to me to kind of create this almost like poetic treasure hunt. And that's part of the challenge of writing, I think, is is to like kind of disguise it and kind of keep it for myself in a way. Like I want to be able to share it with everyone else and I want to like share the poems and have people enjoy them. But it is fun having like all these kind of secrets that I still haven't revealed um, for quite a few of them. Um, so I think... If, if it's something that is like a surprising texture or is like a really beautiful phrase, that might be enough. But also sometimes I do have to think kind of practically, um, like with the newsletters, are there enough kind of like verbs and things like that and like really kind of boring technical stuff. Um, so it feels kind of instinct, but if it's like a harder source text, then I have more, more fun with it. I tried to use the Pretty Woman screenplay because... Um, like there's a line where like Harry talks about like romantic comedies, um, but that was really challenging because the dialogue turned out to be like really generic. Like the script itself wasn't particularly like it was it was fine, but like there wasn't really that much to work with, and I was kind of taken aback by that. So it's kind of surprising like the sources that have become like ones that I can really rely on, um, and it turned out to be like these One Direction newsletters rather than just whatever is, is fun. Like I just try and make it fun for myself and the reader. Mm -hmm. I know in your work, Richard, you often draw on your influences from other writers. And how does that, are these people that you kind of feel a very strong connection with or you feel like they challenge you or what draws you particularly to the people you've used in your text? Um, that's such a good, that's a, such a good and generous question. Thank you so much. Oh, I, I, yeah, I guess it's really varied. Like, I guess you kind of go, like Bibi says, you kind of go on, on instinct and, and what feels right and what appeals. It's like, I guess my obsession with Paul Verlaine, um, kind of was born out of a kind of loneliness in a way and a kind of want to kind of evoke like a queer ancestor, 
um, yeah, at a time when Soho is sort of under enormous pressure of kind of gentrification and being changed. And so I kind of wanted, in a way, that kind of support, support from the book. Um, I also finding, find myself, like, writing back to people as well. Like, I think it's really good to kind of, if there is someone who kind of... Um, you love but challenges you like for instance Walt Whitman who is um, mm. an amazing poet but a really difficult um, and at times dreadful person and so for me like an act of um, loving someone is kind of writing back to them a little bit so um, I find myself like simultaneously evoking people because I love them and other times because you're kind of um, writing back to them and want to be in, in dialogue with them I suppose. Mm. Yeah, I was so excited when I saw you'd written about Paul Verlaine because he was a huge... I was so obsessed with him when I was a teenager and Rambo. So I was really thrilled to see somebody else. I mean, I'm sure lots of people have engaged with him, but the way you wrote about him was just... And giving him this queer dimension really meant so much to me. It was so exciting. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you so, thank you so much. That's so nice. I often feel like he kind of um, doesn't get enough focus in a way because um, yeah. people think so much... Rambo, like Rambo, of course, is like a total genius, but there's so much kind of subtlety in Verlaine's work. And like the, if I, if I, because my project was to try and, you know, evoke him and su support, you know, my own poetry and headspace with the presence of this queer ancestor. But also I learned just such a huge amount from him. Like I learned so much from symbolism, like the way he evokes an atmosphere, his syntax, his punctuation, like, um, to kind of immerse yourself in Berlin is like the gift that keeps on giving, basically. Yeah. Sean, um, one of my first introductions to the Buila Swivna was through your work. And I wondered when you'd first encountered um, the Buila Swivna and what drew you to wanting to write or translate it. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, the it's, it's not a particularly um, easy text to translate uh, because it's mm. it's quite hefty and and i think a lot of it is you know i'll probably get shot by someone for saying this but um a lot of it is um is interesting in the context of of the poem uh, but if you lift it out it's not necessarily unnecessary i found so there's a lot of um uh you know talk of battles and and, and things like that that i i just cut um mm. a lot of the narrative um so it would usually be about 100 pages long or so um and i like cut it down to about 14 poems i think um and in a similar way to uh to richard there speaking about the land I, I really loved the atmosphere of it and i hope that the poems would be able to uh hold the atmosphere um without needing all the narrative um, mm -hmm. I first found it uh, when I was studying Middle Irish at, at university, um, and then I was very stuck for for about six months on not being able to write anything, uh, so I thought I would go for a translation. Uh, and then I found that it kind of unlocked stuff that I didn't have uh, a narrative for, or I didn't have a setting for, or a character for. Um, and when I found myself translating them, I found uh, a lot of myself coming into into that text. Um, so it felt very mm. much like it freed me to uh, write in ways that weren't so personal, but they were still became personal through, through the interaction with the text. Um, so yeah. That's right. It's very interesting, yeah. One thing that I notice in all three of your work and that really draws me to it is that there's this sense of kind of vulnerability and openness. And I wondered if writing um, has kind of freed you up and made you feel like it's easier to continue to write poems about things that are very personal or very vulnerable, or is it something that you find very difficult um, I'll, I'll go. Uh, Thanks. I, I actually, I think to begin with, uh, some of the poems in, in the book I was, uh, which is stupid because they're not particularly like graphic in any way. Um, but I think mm -hmm. when they're close to you in a, in a personal subject, you, you don't want to, uh, you feel a sense of shame perhaps of, of reading them. And I think 
to begin with, reading them aloud to an audience. Um, and I think you kind of get over that if just doing it more often. Um, yeah. and, and now I'm not so bothered about how uh, you kind of say anything in a poem, because I, I think that comes with a bit more confidence um, in just, you know, nothing terrible is happening so far. So uh, let's, let's go for it. But to begin with, I think it's quite a nerve wracking thing. Um, it's not really a very normal thing to stand in front of, you know, maybe a hundred people and tell them about blowjobs. So um, you have to uh, you have to build up some uh, separation between yourself and the poem. Sometimes I think uh, as well. What about you, BB? Would you find it difficult to? Um, I find it easier to write about things than to talk about them, but I find it hard to admit that. Yeah. I think. Um, mm. Like gold light shining is kind of full of like Harry and boys and Beyonce Flynn told me that I was like obsessed with boys and that's not necessarily the case but I really didn't know how to write about girls and I didn't know how to write about myself in those poems even though like I'm in this whole book like I find it really difficult to admit that whereas now I feel like working on the kind of sign language poems and a journey that is like more explicitly me I have to kind of confront that and I found that to be really challenging um but I think, like Sean says, like it comes with confidence and it comes with just being able to like kind of like be at peace with yourself. And if you find that challenging, then of course it's going to be challenging to like write these things and admit that out loud. So I think it's like a process and it's a journey. Um, but it's something that I feel like I'm like confronted with every time I like sit down and try and write. Um, and obviously like the poetic eye is, is so often talked about and, you know, it can be ignored and we can brush it aside. But you know, there is like truth at the heart of all these poems often. So um, it's difficult to kind of just have that like resilience to be like, OK, I'm going to like do this and write it and say it and nobody will care. Um, but I'm hoping I'll get there someday. I mean, you both, you've both just said everything so eloquently. So I, I mean, I guess my, my thing is like, I, I, don't, I don't really know. Like, I, uh, um, I guess, um, like Sean, like I'm kind of interested in this idea of like lyric shame, like how writing can prompt this um, strange feeling of kind of shamefulness. So when you are open or maybe supposedly kind of open, you, you, you can feel shame. And I don't know, I've kind of been really affected by writers who, who write about that, like um, uh, Denise Riley and Nur al write so beautifully about that sense of lyric shame. And, and, and I do think about that. And... I guess I also think about um, um, the, the masks to, to mm. write about ourselves. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I think maybe it's not always entirely um, straightforward that I'm using a mask, but I guess I kind of use the mask of language um, to kind of disguise disguise myself or disguise a kind of a part of myself, um, potentially. Um, and... Uh, and I think that there's a kind of big tradition of kind of queer poets who kind of, um, yeah, who, who, who just put through the spoon of language and use it as a kind of veil through which to kind of hide their lyric shame. And I guess I'm kind of interested in, in, in that too. Um, all, all of that is a big way of saying I don't really know the answer to the question, but it's a really, um, it's a really good and personal and amazing question. I, mean, I guess... Um, like BB, I'm still, I'm still I'm still thinking about it and working on it. Sure. Yeah. No, oh, that's all really it. interesting. It, ask me. No, uh, BB and, and Richard, because I'm interested. Um, do you, do you mm. have trouble, or do do you find a challenge in not writing about yourself? Because I find that to be a more difficult challenge for me, as in how do I approach a subject that I'm not centre of uh, and, and I wonder if you have any um, if you found that if actually one of, you know there's a difficulty in writing the I but Richard uh, well, both, both of you do uh, do well it seems to me in writing poems that don't feature yourselves as well so I wonder um, if you found that a challenge I think probably like using using a kind of mask like um, maybe like the prism of Paul Verlaine or like um, his concerns 
um, kind of, I guess, helps me kind of move away from like um, the the I, like the difficult I, or it's like other kind of tropes, like writing in a kind of psychogeographical manner. Like when I was writing about Soho, that really helps me because it's kind of like, oh, what what maybe is your archetypal speak kind of um, I or speaker in a psychogeographical poem, and that's kind of a kind of uh, I don't know drunk person around the area like, who's high on life and I've certainly been that person <laughs> but also kind of it, it helps me with a kind of bit of a, a, a mask I suppose uh, again I keep using that word mask which is really strange um, I feel like there's probably like a really psychological answer to that question somewhere um I feel like it kind of comes in like I feel like I'm nicer to other people than I am to myself like I feel like I can be quite like self-critical or you know if you're writing it it is such a personal experience and like the process of it so I feel like I'm constantly like judging myself in that process so when I put like a bit of distance um between like myself and maybe like a character or often like my sources have been kind of like um like scam there's like lots of these kind of like um, like refractions anyway um so it feels like there's like kind of six degrees of separation like having that distance almost then makes me be able to like kind of treat myself nicer again um so I feel like it's kind of like I'm constantly looking for like little mirrors where there's like little like peaks of me or like there's influences that are there but um I don't have to like admit that as openly and then it's just like easier (laughs) I don't know um but I have found like now that I'm trying to like write more about myself the worst poems I've written have been in that kind of bridge between been like going from writing with like distance and like a observation kind of all-knowing kind of perspective and then trying to be like here are my inner thoughts and feelings like they've been shocking um so <laughs> I do think of it is like instinct and balance and figuring out like what sources are like there for you and yourself anyway that you can just like blame on on other things but I don't think I answered that very well sorry <laughs> yeah I think drawing on your own whatever sources you happen to have is a good answer that there's many different ways to get at yourself and at other versions of yourself or other people that you're trying to write about yeah that's well, that was really saying. interesting <laughs> <laughs> that was really interesting and I think I have to cut this off now and I'm really sorry because I feel like I could we could talk about this all day and I would be really interested and it's such a privilege to have you know, all three of you in my messy office with me. It's brilliant. Um, So I'm really happy that you could join us. And it was a very exciting event for me. And I hope that our enjoyed audience will enjoy it a lot too. Um, Thanks so much for coming to Read and Talk. And thanks to everyone who's watched this event. Um, We will be holding further installments of the Poetry of the Lexicon series in the coming months. So please look for us in June. And for now, good night. And good night. And thanks again to Bibi, Sean and Richard. Thank you. Thank you.